what's up you guys welcome to the imagination i'm your host emma and today i am really honored to bring to you a guest that i actually met through a mutual friend kathy fox who if you guys are in kind of the human trafficking child abuse world of research you have probably come across her she actually introduced me to a survivor that i connected with who agreed to come on in her story when i say it blows me away i mean all the stories that I've had and introduced to you guys have blown me away, but I think Kaylee's story is going to really open up your eyes to some things that we haven't talked about. And it's also going to elaborate on a lot of topics that we have talked about. So Kaylee Shaber Gandhi is joining us today and she is an occult survivor, a child trafficking survivor, and she was actually born into um, the occult specifically for trafficking. And she has a very, very high level and elite story that is going to be a little bit different um, than some of the things that you guys might have heard on here so far. Um, please put down anything that, that you're doing. I would love if you guys would all pay attention to Kaylee's story. I think everybody that's listening, you're going to take a lot from this. We're going to chip away at her story. We probably won't cover um, even close to all of it in this episode. So I hope that you guys hang around and, and really follow the the following episodes that we're going to have after this but really pay attention take notes listen 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 share subscribe and get the word out on this story because this is in my opinion this is one of the biggest and most important stories that i think i'll ever have on this podcast so kaylee thank you so much for being here with me today yeah thank you i appreciate you coming on i know i know the world is crazy right now so i appreciate you yeah. taking this time <laughs> I so I'd love to start, I guess, at the beginning of your story. I know that there's so much that we can leaf through. I was just telling you before we jumped on, I could probably talk to you for 10 years and we'd still just be scratching the iceberg, uh, the tip of the iceberg. But I'd love for people to, to learn a little bit about what that means when I said um, that you were born into this program and for you to word that in your own words, because it's still something I'm learning about and these breeding programs and these these occult programs um, and trafficking programs, especially government oriented, there are things that a lot of people don't hear about much. And I'd love for you to maybe start from the very beginning. And like I said, we'll just we'll chip away at it um, and I'll, I'll intervene with questions. Um, but I'd love for you to just give a little intro on the beginning of your story and we'll just work towards the present. Well, I was born into a satanic cult family um, who practiced occultism and satanism and they i think that they were into some my grandfather had ties to nasa he worked at bremen um so they were doing all kinds of science experimentation things through through nasa programs and i believe that my mom was a breeder so they bred her and they were taking eggs and embryo and, and putting them in you know and various women and you know i know jeffrey epstein back then was doing this project um wanting to seed the human race with his dna and all this crazy stuff was going on and um they had these connections so they were they were you know breeding my mom and basically i was born for trafficking purposes so i was born to be sold as a small child you know think, um, bring you started at, at three okay i read something I think one thing before about what you said about Jeffrey Epstein, I totally forgot about it until you just said that. So that's actually true. I think it was a I meme. Was in the I was trafficked to Epstein. Yeah, I was trafficked to Jeffrey out of, um, my mom had been married before I was born, actually, to a man named Gary, Gary Kimball of Brevard County, Titusville in Florida, uh, which was about an hour and a half from Vero where we lived. And I've known Gary my whole life, even though it was my mom's ex-husband. I grew up around Gary and being flown out of his airport. He owns a private airport in Brevard County that I would be flown out of. Jeffrey Epstein used to fly in and out of there. And back then, um, you know, they, they controlled all the air traffic control and stuff in and out of there. So they could get in and out of there pretty inconspicuously. Wow. So he actually did say that about, I want to basically spread my seed to all these girls. And um, so that's true, that's disgusting. Uh, no, Jeffrey into all kinds of stuff. I believe, and a lot of people I don't think know this, yeah. but I have seen Jeffrey get very severely ritually abused. Um, I have seen him strapped to chairs 
with these straps across his face like a gas mask to, like to, and being tortured literally and screaming and yelling and I'm just this little girl and they're forcing me to watch this type of stuff and and it was Jeffrey um but he became a handler they they manufactured him as well and um he he became a handler and he was basically a fall guy and a front guy for them I mean he was controlled too and I, I don't think a lot of people realize that you know everybody looks at Jeffrey because of the mainstream media pushing this narrative that he's this monster but he was used as well and he he was used as a fall guy essentially but I mean they were doing all kinds of things to him um I believe that something I mean, if I remember correctly, that something happened to his jaw, like an attempted dismemberment. So he had like jaw problems, upper jaw problems, where they were taking these teeth out of boys and children and using them for um, um, sexual purposes, you know, or oral sex. They would knock your teeth out so, so you, you know, could be used for oral sex purposes, all kinds of stuff like that. So I think they did that stuff to Jeffrey. Um, they, they actually took my eye teeth out when I was an a infant. They took the, the pods, the teeth pods out, and they grew my teeth in a lab. So I ended up with demon teeth. They call them demon teeth. They take your eye teeth, which correlates with my name. I lack eyes. Kaylee Shea backwards is the I lack eyes. They took my eye teeth, which are, there's something about the eye teeth being connected to a nerve to the back of your eyes or something like that. And I, and I was, um, you know, blindfolded and hoodwinked, they call it, for most of my abuse. So I wouldn't be able to tell, like, who was raping me during gang rapes. I wouldn't be able to look out the window of cars. So I couldn't tell, like, where I was being taken or by whom. And this all started whenever you were born, basically. Do you... Yeah, I was born into the cult. So, I mean, from the time I was born... Um, they start using you right away for, for, you know, practices. And like I said, they, they took my teeth buds before my teeth even came in. So they took those and grew them in the lab. Um, the women start grooming the babies from, from infancy. Um, I've seen it done, you know, during diaper changes and they'll finger the babies to get them used to it, get them used to the sexual abuse. So that's what the women in my family do. Oh my gosh. That's mm -hmm. absolutely horrific. And so it, children, it, it it's is. like, they're so- I watched, I, I was invited to a luncheon. My cousin, Miss Starry Gravy Lindner, uh, married into this very wealthy family after being trafficked most of her life by, uh, by our family as well. They were all into it. And, um, and we were invited to a luncheon over at the Vero Beach Hotel. She used to fly the family's private jet down to Vero every couple months and stay at the Vero Beach Hotel and have everybody come to the hotel and do lunch with her because we didn't get to see her much when she got married and moved away. And she had a nanny with her two little girls at the pool and I'm sitting there by the pool and the kids are in the pool. She gets the baby out of the pool and she's um, changing the baby and she starts fingering the baby and I start screaming. I started screaming at the pool and then a needle was stuck in my leg by another family member and I was drugged, silenced for trying to get help. horrific and I can't imagine how that impacts a child like they're not just grooming the infant but they groom you to essentially just keep your mouth shut look the other way whenever you see anything wrong happening right and that's essentially what most of the people in my family do and I'm I'm like the black sheep you know because I have been hoodwinked for a lot of this stuff my family has ritually abused me my entire life with a blindfold on <sighs> So everybody else watches, but I don't. So when I actually visually am able to see stuff like that, I call it out. And when I do, I'm usually silenced by either being drugged or beat or raped myself. You know. When is your earliest memory that you had recall on? As far as uh, being a child? Yeah. And like understanding, I know the abuse obviously starts whenever you're born. What age do they start? ritually abusing and kind of increasing that with these children I three, when I was um I was going to first church of God is what it's called it's on the corner of 20th avenue and 8th street in Vero Beach Florida and I was being taken there um I'm not sure if that was the daycare that was into the occult or not because I've been to daycares that are um 
owned by occult members and then abused in daycares and stuff too. My family owned daycares in Indian River County that they were using for child prostitution and trafficking purposes. Um, they had they had their own little school bus and stuff like that. But my first memory um, was basically going to that first church of God and going out of class because I had cramps. I didn't, you know, I was like three or four years old in daycare and I don't, um, I couldn't identify what was wrong with me. I just went to the toilet and I sat on the toilet and I had blood in my underwear and I didn't know it was blood. I thought it was like poop or something and I'm going, I need help. And um, I sat there on the toilet at First Church of God for like hours until a teacher finally came looking for me. And I believe DCF was called at that point. So it did create a rift for them for a while. And I was taken out of that daycare and then put into another daycare where they could abuse me and get away with it. But that that's my first um, memory, you know, um, of being abused was that particular incident where I sat on that toilet forever, you know, not knowing what was going on or what was happening to me. And so your family, what did they do? Because I know, obviously, in an occult, um, how did they show up in society? What did your parents do? Um, my mother worked in banking. Um, they had a lot of mob ties, a lot of um, ties to biker gangs and other types of brotherhoods also um, that, you know, it's all one in the same. That's what they say. You know, it's every, you know, it's all one in the same. So they, um, she worked in banking. She was a plant basically to uh, get, obtain account information for wealthy people and target wealthy people in and around Indian River County. Her and a lot of her friends, uh, Renee Griffith, uh, Penny, um, this lady named April Glover worked at the bank for her. She was a younger girl, um, but they were all targeting wealthy families in Vero and they were used in the banking system to obtain account information. So she was like a teller and stuff like that at the bank, but also getting paid outside of the bank job she had by the network for getting getting them you know, the account information. So they were, they were kind of gangster. She had a lot of friends like that, Darlene Dollins, Heckman, Renee Griffith, I grew up around these women being uh, raped by their men and their families and their husbands would participate in this stuff. You know, I wasn't allowed to have friends that weren't in the cult. So I was raped by all my friends' fathers. Um, everywhere they took me, they knew somebody, um, restaurants, restaurant owners, banks, bankeries, bakeries, um, the bank president that she worked at at First American, or it was not First American Title, it was First American Bank. Alex McWilliam owned the bank. We used to call him Mr. Mac. And after hours, they would go up front and lock the door of the bank at five o'clock and then bring me into his office and he would rape me on the desk in his office at the bank. These are bank presidents. These are restaurant owners. These are, you know, people tied into the network. They incur in the, in the cult, they encourage you to get into, you know, a position of power or uh, politics or law enforcement or whatever. So a lot of these people chose to own businesses so that they can incorporate and launder trafficking funds basically through their companies. So a lot of people like my family, they opened daycares, they opened um, hair salons because hair salons were, you know, they were a cheap, easy license to get and they were affordable to open. So my stepmom and my aunt both did hair and owned hair salons that we were prostituted out of our whole life. And then my mom was doing the banking thing until I got to be in about high school probably. And then she quit her banking job, married a man that was 18 years younger than her and became a truck driver. So she was a runner after that. Meaning that they traffic children through the trucking industry. Yeah, she trafficked me. I've been on the road with her before and I've been raped <laughs> and taken to places and drugged. And I've been in the truck with her, as a matter of fact. Um, I don't know what she was doing or what the hell she was hauling. But I've been in the truck with her um, across the country where she, her, her truck was being followed by Secret Service and uh, DOT. And I'm going, you know, I wake up from, you know, in the bunk and I'm going, what the hell's going on? Like, why are we being followed? You know, what the hell are you hauling? She's going, I don't know. I mean, she was basically just paid to drive. She didn't even know what the hell she was hauling half the time. It could have been a box full of human remains for all we know. And honestly, that's a big part of the problem in society is the way that human traffickers and rapists and even occult members are 
marketed or shown to society, you see, for example, people imagine a Satanist to look like a goth, right? All black hair and super no, obvious. No, no, no. These people are your hairdressers. They're your daycare owners. They're people that you trust your kids with. My family is very well liked in the community. Very well liked. There was about 175 people that showed up at my dad's uh, celebration of life that we had for him after he died or disappeared or whatever he did in 2016. I mean, there's a lot of people um, that know them and they don't, but they don't really know them. You know, I mean, it's almost like they have this front. I mean, there's, there's people that know what they do because they practice with them, but most of the community just knows them as normal, regular, nice guys. And that's the scary part is that is exactly what they look like. They don't look like these creepy, um, you know, crackheads that you see on TV. Those are kind of like the one-off cases, you know? I know that that happens where random people have a men mental disease or just there's something wrong with them and they go kidnap a kid or they get into this on a lower level. But really it's the stereotype that we need to get out of people's heads is what they show on the news and how they portray it in movies that these are very obvious people in society that you could pick out and say oh that looks like a rapist or oh that looks like a satanist like these are normal mm -hmm. people like you said that just have normal jobs that we're associating with every single doctors. day i grew up around doctors and physicians of all kinds that have been ritually abused by and tortured by and labs i mean i was raped and used for torture and babies i was a breeder from the age of eight to 14 every year they would impregnate me and they always took the babies at six months they never let me carry full term so i never got super big but i was always made to wear bigger clothes um to cover myself so nobody knew um you know that it was a big secret but they would take the babies prematurely at about six months and they were either being used for trafficking purposes or killed and sacrifices you know ceremonies so several of mine were were killed and my father uh strangled one in the back bedroom that was born and then uh forced us to watch him bury it in the backyard were you aware that this stuff was happening as a child or did they dissociate you for these memories and you had recollections? I do have dissociative disorder. So yeah. I do dissociate from my body during violent rape and torture. Um, so I'm, I'm present, but not, and I can, I can kind of control it in a sense where I can kind of tune back into my body if I need to. Um, so I, I am, like I said, I'm present, but I'm not. So I do remember these things, but um, I was heavily drugged for the pregnancies, especially during the time of birth, because they would induce me or take the baby in an unnatural way. So I was heavily drugged for the births most of the time. And um, I would be woken up because they have antidotes, obviously, for all the drugs that they have. And I would be woken up and I would be allowed to hold the baby. Um, they have pictures of me with these babies and then they, they would be taken. And then I was just rest and recovery after that. So I spent a lot of my life recovering from uh, violent rape, torture, and attempted murder. Multiple child, you know, pregnancies and just being beat on. Did your family have you participate in society also normally? Did you go to school normally, play sports, things like that? I did. I was trafficked through the school system in Indian River County. So there were teachers, school board members, principals, um, other other people like that in the network that that you know worked at these schools, ran these schools, and I would be taken out of class, like literally signed out of class. Men would come and get me, and I would be raped, and then brought back to class and picked up from school like every other kid. And teachers were aware of this. There were teachers participating, Diane Hawkins. Um, she is the sister of Kevin Hawkins. Kevin Hawkins and Tim Rose, I was a child bride to run an enterprise in Indian River County. And there, we call them grave diggers. You know, I grew up in the death business. My dad worked for FMC, which was food, machinery, and chemicals. So he worked, you know, around a lot of grove owners and in the fruit business. And so did they, they were contractors. You know, they was all kind of one and the same there. And um, I don't remember where I was going with that. Sorry, I just had a brain. Oh, it's okay. You were we were talking about playing sports and going to school. 
Yeah, so yeah, I was allowed to go to school, but I was still being used through the school district. I was used everywhere I went. Everywhere I went. I couldn't be taken to a restaurant without being bent over a table in a kitchen or a counter, you know, and raped by the men that are, are in the cult. I mean, I went, you know, banks, bakeries, Ferrara's bakery. I would be raped there at Scampi Grill, um, Vincent's Pizza, and Vero. I've been gang raped around, you know, there. I, I, you know, here I am thinking I'm going to dinner with my family. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes up behind me, makes me get out of my chair, bends me over the table, and rapes me in front of my entire family. Everybody sits there and doesn't do a damn thing about it. They just watch. So a lot of times that's what's happened to me. But yeah, I mean, like I said, I was going to school, but I was also being used at school by teachers, by principals. Um, when I got up into high school, I was being used a lot there um, or, you know, taken by a teacher and shoved into a bathroom and raped or taken over to um, Mr. Carroll's office and raped in his office. There were people like Liz Santiago in the office of Indian River Charter High School that her son wanted to get into the music industry. And they offered her family like this music deal for her son. But she had to participate in this occult practice and let these men rape these, these certain girls that went to my high school. There was, I mean, they put us all in, a lot, a lot of us all in the same schools. Really? Yeah, I, yeah. Is that how that normally works in in everywhere in the country? (laughs) That it's the the counties that I, I mean, were Indian River, Putnam County, Brevard, uh, Broward, you know, all up and down the East Coast was kind of like their territory. But yeah, I do believe that that's how they do it. They they get you know they get a network and and uh, we were basically in the John Walsh network basically, in Indian River County, which is the head of the operations. In Florida, that's where all of this was taking place and still is, right? Mm-hmm. So is that, yeah. is Florida specifically? Oslo, school, Indian River Charter School, those are schools that I went to. And my aunt, who worked in the daycare that my grandmother owns, she's a school teacher at Oslo Middle School now. She teaches seventh grade. She's been there for 25 years and she's a damn trafficker. They would rape kids in the daycare. My the men in my family and other men in the cult would come into the daycare when we were kids and act as maintenance men and just snatch a kid, take them in the bathroom and rape them. They hunt, they're predators, you know, and they kind of hone that behavior and they actually, you know, practice that. They get good at it and they feel like they're good at it, you know, so they want to go like they go on these hunts. So so I, I think it's important for people to know anybody that says that they hunt, you really need to be you you know pay attention to the people that say they hunt because these predators also hunt but they're not hunting animals they're hunting women and children like animals boys too it doesn't matter they just go on hunts i've been on hunts with my family or they're preying on other people what is that process or what is for because that's something too a lot of people don't know about that and I don't think we've talked about that yet at all on the podcast would you be able to explain what those hunts my are father, my father was a serial killer he was a, a grave digger and a transporter of human remains for the cult and we grew up around he worked in packing houses in the fruit business so he was around a lot of um you know plants uh juice plants ocean spray uh Natalie's orange juice uh, dull citrus, you know, Indian River County at one time was supposedly the number one distributor in the world for grapefruit, but I think grapefruit might have been a code word for children. So, you know, I would hear a lot of stuff like, you know, my dad would come over to my grandfather's house and, oh, how's the fruit business? You know, they would always refer to it as the fruit business. How's the fruit business? But they were transporting, um, corpse and human remains and things like that and buckets of fruit in and out of Indian River County because the um, you know rotting fruit will attract a black fly like corpse and rotting human remains do so it's easier to transport without getting caught and you might be sitting right next to one of these bucket trucks at a stoplight not even knowing and these trucks travel all around the country I'm guessing because I know even out here in Nevada have florida made something you know oranges from florida orange juice whatever it is anywhere you can drive a truck yeah 
absolutely, you know, I would be taken to the plants. I would be taken to the heads of operation. I would be taken to dull citrus. I would be taken to ocean spray and to places like that. And then taken down, you know, I, they showed me, they would give me tours of the factories and stuff like that. A lot of them were pretty neat to be able to see the production, the, you know, the conveyor belts with the fruit being destemmed, coming down the line. And then it goes through washing and then it goes through waxing and, and they worked on a lot of those machines and stuff. Like I said, um, FMC was food, machinery, and chemicals. So they dealt with the food business, food industry, the machinery that processed food and chemicals. So they had, you know, they were manufacturing all kinds of chemicals, even using juiced human remains because they, they were doing that as part of the occult practice. There's rollers on these machines that they were making big enough to put a cadaver through. So they would juice fruit and then, you know, they would juice human remains. And they were using the juices to uh, manufacture products. These products go into different food things for flavoring. They go into lip fillers and face fillers. They go into a lot of things. People can research that, but it's important to know. I've seen it done. Um, those tunnels that I were talking about recently, um, they actually had turned some of these tunnels into like a juicing track. So these cars would, these train cars, like a little ride at Disney would go down these tracks and they're dark and scary down there in these tunnels. And I remember being with my handler in, in one of the cars and there was a train car in front of us and he was raping the girl in front of us. And she appeared to be drugged. I mean, her head was hung low, her hair was in her face. And when he was done with her, he, um, they basically take like this prod and they prod you in the neck and some of them my handler used to do it to me he would drink the blood right out of my neck so it wasn't like they were putting it in a vial or doing anything like that I mean they would drink it straight from your body so he did that to her in front of us and then when he was done with her corpse he just threw her out on the tracks which those the, the tracks on that particular tunnel that I was on and I don't know where it was but there is one that exists still to this day that's running and they they took the train tracks on they put rollers you know, just like the packing houses, and I'm going, oh my God, what are they doing down here? But there's rollers. So once you get stuck in those tracks, those train cars come through there all day long, and they just juice, juice the remains that are left on the track. And then they were piped underneath. Um, they were piped to go collect the juice off of the tracks and go into these large tanks. So once we got to the end of this track and into the building, they took me downstairs. Well, you could actually see every time somebody was juiced upstairs, the machine would like purge, you know, and the juice would come out into the uh, buckets, into the big drums. So I remember being there and seeing as a little kid and them explaining to me what was happening. And I'm going, oh my God. So every time I saw the, the machine purge more juice, I would cry because I knew somebody had just died. Did you know, I mean, it seems like with most of the survivors that I've had already on this show, there seems to be certain people that no matter how many times somebody tries to break their spirit, which is exactly what they were trying to do to you, they never can. And there's always something inherently wrong in those people, no matter what where other people like your parents, it becomes something that they just, they participate in and, and it's nothing to them. Was this right. to you, like, at what age did you start to say, wait, this, I know that this is how my family <laughs> is operating and I know that this is what they do, but this doesn't feel right. Yeah, when did you start to, to think that? Cause that had to have been hard if you're born into it and that's all you know. As long as I can remember, I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. I used to say to my brother, husband, handler, whatever he is, he, he grew up with me like a brother and then he became my handler. Um, they actually let us stay together and we did get married in the backyard in the satanic ritual ceremony. Sorry, I gotta get my dog. Um, I would tell him when I was a little girl and he would rape me, I would say, you're sick to me. Or I would say, Laura, I would say to my mom, Laura, he's being sick to me. Or these guys are sick to me. I would just say sick to me. I didn't know how to identify what was happening to me, but I knew it was sick. <laughs> and they have videos of me saying that, things like that. You're sick to me. Walking around after being raped, you're sick. 
you're sick. I would tell them you're sick to me. <laughs> so I've known all along that yeah. it's wrong. I hated it. I hated it. And I never understood it. I was always so confused why everywhere I, everywhere I go with you, this happens to me. I don't understand why this keeps happening. You know, they would act like they were oblivious sometimes, like, oh, they would just take me over to so-and-so, leave me in his office and then go, you know, go to the break room, go get a snack, go get something to eat, let them rape me and come back. It was just like nothing. And I'm going, why does this keep happening to me? You know, I couldn't under, I couldn't understand why it kept happening over and over and over and I couldn't stop it. And there was no help for me. I mean, I try, I would try to tell on people, who was I going to tell? They were all doing it to me. They were all doing it to me with my eyes closed. So I was thinking something happened to me and these other people are doing this to me. I'm trying to tell on them, but I'm telling the people that are doing it to me on themselves, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Because most of the time while while I was being raped, they would put something over my face. They would mask me, hoodwink me. They called it hoodwink um, or put something over my face so that I didn't know who was actually raping me at the time. So it made it even harder for me to identify, which correlates with the, what they were trying to do as far as whatever experiment they were doing with me is with my eyes, you know, lacking eyes, not having eyes. My name backwards is I lack eyes. They took my eye teeth. So a lot of those things. And for people listening, we'll all have her explain how to find her, but that's her Twitter name is I lack eyes. So if you guys are on your phone right now, or if you have access to it, go follow her. She, she's really disclosing a lot on Twitter too. So you'll definitely want to keep, keep in touch with her there, especially um, after you guys listen to this episode. Now, Kaylee, why, I mean, for people who have kind of looked into this, I think um, they might just know that child abuse is a big part of occult systems and human trafficking systems. But why is that? How did child abuse get so embedded into these cult systems? And why is that so important to them? Well, the, the, I, I think the, I think that it really boils down to occultism being the problem. If you could just look at occultism as a brotherhood, you know, simply it's brotherhood and trafficking of any kind all over the world would not exist without this brotherhood. So the roots of the issue, and I tell people all the time, you have to get to the roots. If there's something that you want to stop or fix or transform or change, you have to get to the roots of the issue. And the roots of these trafficking issues are occultism. So if you start researching occultism, the history of occultism in the United States, how occultism became legal in the United States when the Church of Scientology became a legal church entity and tax exempt in 78, which was right before the uh, ritual sacrifice of Adam Walsh. So right before that happened, they were bringing occultism into the United States under the guise of a religion. So they hide behind this Freedom of Religion Act that this is a religion now because they got it. They had enough people you know, where they got Scientology named as a church in the United States in 1978, I believe it was, it's on my page. Um, and then after that, it was basically like they, they had free reign to do whatever they want because they could hide under the Freedom of Religion Act. If you go back and look at interviews with Jeffrey Epstein and his previous cases, that's one of his main escapes is I'm not from this country and that's against my beliefs and that's not what I believe. And, you know, those were all the excuses that he used to kind of skate around the law for practicing what he practices. And so because it's legal, it's something that also society probably doesn't understand to look into. Occultism, that's the thing. Occultism in the United States is not legal, but that's exactly what they're doing. Um, It's not legal. Freedom of religion is legal. Occultism is not. But if you look at uh, the origins of Scientology, Scientology clearly states that it's a cult. It's not a religion, but it's named as a religion in America so that they could get around the law. And a lot of this was brought into the States by people like Sir Richard Branson, who was knighted by the royal family, and Ed Borsage, who owns a private island right next to Branson, um, that I've been trafficked to my whole life. My, my family lives in the Bahamas four months out of the year on Compass K, which is 
uh, they call it Tucker's Island, Tucker Rowley. He comes up to Vero and stays. He's the, uh, he owns the island. He stays with them in Vero when he comes to Vero. Um, his, and, and, and here's, you know, there's, they're all connected. So Tucker gets his shirts and other material printed by a printing company in Vero Beach that's also owned by uh, my cult friends, Tara, Gianna, uh, um, Adams, and um, what's his name? Garrett Adams people that I've been trapped to throughout my life. Their, their families were home builders and contractors in Indian River County. They own a printing company now. They print t-shirts for Tucker. My aunt and uncle pick up the t-shirts, take them down to the Bahamas and they stay down there four months out of the year. So yeah. How does this brotherhood work as far as how it's structured? I know you've talked about all the way from school teachers all the way up to government. Um, how How is the occult oh, I mean, it's, it's, the school system is government. I mean, it's all state, it's all government, and I was trafficked through the government. I was a born government sex slave for the White House, the FBI, local law enforcement, Masonic, Freemasonry, cop gangs. Um, there's a free, free uh, Kaylee, your phone's cutting out a little bit. I oh, know we lost her. Okay, we got her back. We All right, sorry, <laughs> I don't know what happened. It is okay, that's happened so many times on here and I'm like- I had to change my VPN, that's crazy. Wow. Yeah, this is like, it gets really weird sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's getting a little hairy, huh? Yes. Okay, there we go. That Now this is working. Sure okay. There's a lot of people that don't want me talking about this, and I understand that. I think people need to understand and realize I am a very targeted individual. And I'm really sorry that that interrupted you too. I know that you were talking about cops and it happened to shut off, um, which is also yeah. ironic. So hopefully it was just reception and nobody's messing with it. Um, but please everybody say, say some prayers also while you're listening, um, just for, for Kaylee's protection too, because she is taking a big, big risk coming on here and talking about this. Um, so I'm trying to, to think where it cut off right before it hung up. Yeah, I don't remember what I was saying. Um, I I'm think we were talking <laughs> Oh, I know I texted you. You're like, wait, I was still talking. <laughs> um, we were talking about the brotherhood and just how the occult structured a little bit. Um, I forget exactly where it cut you off on, but I know you were starting to talk about how the, the structure of all of this works. Uh, with the brotherhood? I yeah, was brought up in, in Freemasonry. I basically, I basically didn't have parents. My mom pawned me off on on men, various men I was sold to, married to as a child bride, taken overseas to foreign countries where it was uh, legalized, where they don't have laws on child marriages. A lot of um, people don't realize I, I was trafficked a lot by Navy men. There's a, a lot of a lot of men in the family and in the cult that were associated with the Navy and the military armed forces, um, but specifically the Navy, because there are no laws in international waters. So they can get away with just about anything out there. and um and overseas you know in foreign countries they have different laws on child marriages and child rape and abuse and stuff like that so they were taking me to foreign countries marrying me to men but I wasn't just being used for for sex um you know I'd be forced to live with them for months at a time and their families their kids would get up like normal kids and go to school and I would be stuck in the room I wasn't allowed to go to school for months at a time I wasn't fed for days at a time I was beat and raped all day just used uh for sex when I was with these men um, but that's how they were doing it. And like I said, I wasn't just used, being used for sex. I was being used for my identity. So every time my identity changed, which was multiple times, I have several aliases. Some of my known aliases are Claire J. Cooper, uh, Claire J. Walker, and Sarah Bernhardt. And uh, Bernhardt, because I would cry during rape, so they would call me Sarah Bernhardt. And... Um, there, there's a few more that I that I can remember, but I know there's more than that. Um, but they're using my identity, and that's basically to traffic 
uh, funds offshore to hide uh, laundered funds and uh, trafficking funds and various accounts in my name that are being kept from me offshore um, and in corporations likely, you know, overseas. So, I mean, they're using children, not just for sexual purposes, they're using them for their identity. They're using them for science experimentation. I was sold to NASA and used in NASA programs, put in simulators um, where I was forced to stay in a simulator for uh, weeks at a time. They were experimenting on the different, you know, gravitational forces and things like that and how it would affect a child. Um, they were doing different experiments on me um, in these capsules. You know, there was zero gravity, so you're floating around the air. If you pee, you pee in the air, you catch it in a bag. Crazy stuff like that. A lot of that probing. Um, they would probe you in your orifices with these pure crystal rods. You know, those like anal thermometers that they use mostly on like animals or babies or whatever. Like they were taking pure crystal rods like that to obtain, um, you know, cells and things like that with the crystals and then they were flying them in space capsules into space and, and growing them in labs and experimenting with all these different cells. So I know my cells have like been in space. <laughs> Through these other, did you come across other children or did they isolate you for these? Um, were, I'm assuming that there's other children that they've used in these experiments. Uh, yeah, I was with, uh, in particular on uh, the NASA trips, I was with my um, my handler, my brother, who became my handler, which I don't think he was my biological brother, but I used to call him Bubby, you know, and then I, then I called him husband at like 10, 10 years old, he became my husband. When I was 10, he was eight years older than me, eight to 10 years older than me-ish. So they always married the boys to the younger girls to groom them. For people that the word handler, um, I know a lot of people have heard that. What exactly is a handler for people who are either new or who, are, who have heard of it, but don't understand what that means? Um, I mean, he handled me. So he, he handled um, everything. He accompanied me on trips. He escorted me on trips uh, to and from and would get me ready. Uh, for these men and take me to them on private jets. So I would be sitting with him on the plane and then he would, you know, put me in my nightgown or whatever. I was forced to wear a white t-shirt a lot as a sim it was symbolic of a child bride. And also so that men could identify me when my parents met them in public places to identify me. Um, so I was always in like a, a white t-shirt. So he would tell me, you know, on the plane, once we got boarded, you know, go get your, go get your t-shirt on. So I, he would take me to the bathroom, I would get my t-shirt on and you, you don't have any clothes on underneath your t-shirt, it's just the t-shirt. And then I would be taken to, you know, up front to the guys that were on the plane, you know, and used for sex. Is Florida in particular important to the system or is that just one of many places that- Oh, I think it's one of many places, but I think it's a huge hub. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Florida is a peninsula. There's water on three sides and you can get anywhere in the world from Florida. They have international airports in Jacksonville and uh, Miami. They just uh, made the regional airport in uh, Fort Lauderdale an international airport. So you can fly internationally right out of Lauderdale now, Clearwater, Tampa, Jacksonville, Orlando, um, all those places I have been flown out of, but mostly out of private estates. Back then I was flying out of private estates. There's uh, two subdivisions that were built um, in Indian River County, one is called Aerodrome, and the other one is called the Fly-In Ranches. And there are uh, private aircraft owners that live there. They're all five to 10 acre tracks, and they have their own private airplane hangars there with a actual landing strip right behind the houses in the subdivision. So you can land your plane and park it in your hangar right there at your property. So a lot of the, I was flown out of private estates like that. Um, and the private airports, you know, that I, I named earlier, Gary Kimball's private airport in uh, Brevard County, Titusville. He was some heir to a NASA executive's fortune, and my mom had married him. So that's their connection to NASA. They were tied into NASA. A lot of these guys don't have, you know, Jesus in their life, and they believe in science. They don't believe in God, and they, um, you know, they're just into all this crazy manipulation and 
science, but and torture and violent rape and bestiality and porn and uh, back then porn was really get the porn industry was really getting big uh, back in the 80s and 90s it started you know coming out you know and and just being kind of like a like a normal practice when it was unheard of before that but in the 80s or 90s when porn started to get big my parents were very sexual and getting into porn wanting to film their own porn and stuff like that and using us in porn as well um through these programs like uh, Disney you know I would Bush Gardens I was raped and trafficked to Peter Bush he had an estate in Vera Beach and they are um the Bush family Bush Garden Bush Beer um they own theme parks you know they own huge conglomerates that are involved in, in these type of things and this was do you uh the spelling of that since it's different than the the political family that that we've seen you had made a comment on Twitter that that was actually a grammar mistake that they just kept with Bush Gardens and with the Bush family, the president, because I was being trafficked to the White House by FBI on Air Force One to the White House during the Bush administration. I was trafficked to Clinton. I've, I've been trafficked to all the presidents since I was born. How far back does this go? Did this start with a certain administration and it's just continued? Has this always been embedded since America? For me, I got into. I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure, but I know that I know that it became rampant in the United States when sci Scientology was like a turning point. I think for the occult here and the occult practices here, and being able to get away with more um, through the Church of Scientology and being able to use that as you know a way around the law. So is Scientology they, basically a front and cover for everything else or is Scientology actually its own type of thing as they market it? Well, it, it's not a church. They call it the Church of Scientology, but it's not a yeah. church. It's not a religion. It is a cult. And there are members that have left that are speaking out, but they have their own police force. They have their own. People don't realize that they they handle matters not within like our tribunals and state and court and local authorities, they handle everything within, you know, so if you're a member of the church and, and something happens, I mean, they, they reprimand you, they, um, they, they have all, all that infrastructure in place through the church. So they have their own police force basically and these gang stalkers that will silence you if you try to speak out against them and the abuse that you've endured at their hand. Um, I used to be taken to the church a lot as a child uh, they have a, an entire floor that I was not allowed on that I would sneak into with my brother. I, I don't, but there was like the fourth and the seventh floor that I was not allowed on for whatever reason, but that's where they kept the cadavers and they are practicing on, um, cadavers. You know, my brother would be down there practicing surgical and suturing techniques and I would help him on these dead bodies. Um, he's a very highly trained doctor and he's been trained since he was a very young child through this cult so and is that purpose they train within so you're not going to a traditional university and they can keep surgeons on staff and doctors internally without having to go outside of this yeah. yeah sure there are some there are some but there a lot of them are educated by the universities I mean if you ask me universities are just a cult too <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's all government, right? Everything owned by government, it's tied in somehow. And how you were saying- I am a government, I'm a born government sex slave. Yes, I was trafficked to the FBI, the uh, masonry cop gangs in Florida, uh, the White House and to the Royals, the Royal family. How did all of this, like, I'm trying to it's think- brotherhood. Of it's brotherhood, it's connections, you know, it's, it's yeah. connection through the church, it's connections through NASA, it's connections, you know, they're all, they're all connected, they, it's, it's a brotherhood, so they, they meet each other um, at these events, you know, which can easily be deceived as a dinner party, you know, so you see in the mainstream media, all these people gathering for these events, and uh, these music awards, and all this shit, and basically it's, it's an occult practice, you know, they're initiation ceremonies for people moving up, um, they're disguised as, you know, uh, concerts, you know, they're, you're taking your children to them and they're basically rituals and ceremonies being done right in plain sight is what they call it. 
And at what age did you say that you you had started being transported and, and being involved with these experiments and going to the White House? Um, I was three when that started, but they didn't get me into the Bush admin until I was probably six. So I was six years old. I was being raped by the president, six, seven years old, um, being raped by the president in the White House, being kept underground in the tunnels. A lot of people don't know there's tunnels underneath the White House. There's a whole underground system underneath the continental U.S. that goes into Mexico. And um, there's underground tunnels and vaults down there that I've been taken to. My brother was interning at the White House back in the day. My handler, husband, brother, whatever. Um, so yeah, he had access, top security clearance to these tunnels and access to the vaults and stuff like that that I would be taken to as a child in my white t-shirt running around the White House halls. Unbelievable. Such a young age. Sometimes for a couple days at a time, they keep you heavily drugged and stuff like that. And they put you to sleep to and from. So you don't really know, you know, where you're going or where you're coming from or whatever. But um, yeah, they're using gas and stuff like that. Even in a lot of these theme parks on these rides, a lot of people don't know, you know, whenever you're going on a ride in the, in the theme parks and then the, the spray comes out and hits you, you know, and it's all this like smoke and fuzz and fire and stuff, but they're actually putting gases, laughing gases and things like that. At Disney and these different theme parks? Uh, yeah, yeah. And there's underground um, tunnels and there's a whole underground world at Disney. We used to be taken to uh, Fort Wilderness bush gardens and yeah disney all over orlando it's saturated in that stuff but we used to be taken underground so underground is when where uh, all the production studios cbs nickelodeon viacom a uh, bunch of those big conglomerates um were involved in in pornography and then they started doing child porn and my parents signed me up for the program i was actually chipped uh i was probably about five when they chipped me they actually stuck you know what a bang stick is no. It's like a, it's a gun that they use. Um, for, it's like, you know, a gun basically at the end of a stick, they take, they took basically like a, a kind of a sort of a bang stick type thing. They put inserted it into my, my vagina and, and punctured my vaginal walls with a chip. So I was chipped for global tracking purposes. I think there were 25 kids chipped at the time that I was chipped. Um, and we were each being used for different things. But some people, were, I, I don't know why they were doing it either, but like some people were to be used for, you know, six hours a day. Some people were to be used for an hour a day. I was to be used, I was one of the 24 hour a day. So 24 hour a day, round the clock, I was to be available for sex. Men would come in to our apartment at night where we lived in Indian River Apartments and rape me in my bed wake me up, rape me in my bed and tell me to go wash. And I was expected to go back to sleep because I had school in the morning. I had, I had a lot of anxiety, social anxiety, problems like that at school. Kids thought I was weird. Um, I didn't dress appropriately. I wasn't being taken care of. Did you ever tell anybody growing up? I wasn't allowed to. And to be honest, I mean, they, they would, they would, they wouldn't teach you properly. You know, they were manipulating you. So you didn't, you know, being that young, you're trying to figure things out on your own. You can't identify. So I had problems identifying what was really happening to me. Um, I didn't know that it was rape. So I couldn't tell somebody that I was being raped. I would tell people they're being mean to me, you know, and, and then teachers and other people would be like, oh, honey, you know, he loves you. He's not being mean you know, whatever. So it was just always really downplayed because I didn't know how to identify it or be able to tell somebody what was happening to me. So I didn't know. I was always in a state of confusion, discombobulated, confused. Just being tossed around, wondering why this kept happening to me. Why am I always in pain? How do they decide what children get chose for what? Well, like I said, I was born for trafficking and these were programs that my parents put me in. Um, so once they signed me over and they sold me, it wasn't, I, they didn't have a choice. You know, my handlers would come and get me sometimes in the middle of the night and rip me out of bed. Sometimes I was forced to pack a small bag. Other times I would just be taken. 
Um, so they could, you know, you were available to them basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You could be at the store with your mom and have no idea that they're about to show up, but they've been trailing you for the last couple of days, you know, and they know where you're at and they just come and, and take you. So I would go with them. I grew up around him, you know, my whole life. So I became comfortable with him. You know, he was being abused also, my handler, my brother, but he was in the programs too. So it was something that we kind of like went into together. And once you're sold, you're sold. Your parents don't even have a choice. You know, at times I think there were, um, they had regrets. I remember, you know, seeing them cry sometimes, but they didn't have a choice. So, you know, they they made their choice and that was to sell us. And once it was done, it was done. Are all major institutions, especially obviously government entertainment, are all of those intertwined, all of them? Is there anything that you know of that is fighting against this or that is not part of that as far as the major institutions of the world? No, no. And that's the sad part that I think people are going to have a hard time with the most is this is the government. These are world leaders. These are uh, presidents of other countries, you know, uh, world leaders all around the world participate in this type of stuff. It's a huge multi-billion dollar business. Um, it, it, it correlates with the food industry, um, any type of machinery that they need to process foods any chemicals they need to process foods. And my dad was an FMC food machinery and chemicals employee for 17 years and transporter of human remains for the cult. And where, what, where would he get these remains? Um, people, believe it or not, if they find a, a body that is unclaimed or a drug addict or something like that and has passed away under a bridge or whatever, a lot of times if people don't come forward to claim the body or cremate the body, um, they will donate it to science. Uh, so I think that's kind of how it started. They were using um, you know, people that were unclaimed that didn't have family or anything like that. And they were using the cadavers for science. And then it just kind of went from there, but it got really bad. And now they're using just anybody they can get their hands on. So they'll use random people that die for these experiments. And then there's also the, the child experiments. Yeah. After my stepmom, her mom passed away. Her husband was into the cult and they tried to change her life and get into Christianity and stuff like that and clean up clean up their life a little bit and and get away from the alcohol and drug use and stuff but um when she passed away they couldn't afford to um do a service for her and he actually put out the idea of donating her body we were like no like we're not doing that with her you know so we all you know pitched in and forked up to have a service done for her so that she wouldn't have been donated to science that's ridiculous i think it's i don't i don't think it's right you know, it's one thing if you if you sign papers and you're willing you're willing to do that. Hey, when you know when it's my time and I go, good, donate me to science. Sure, I mean a lot of people donate their organs. I'm an organ donor. Sure, I mean so. But yeah, like I said, there anything that you um, can liquefy or make into a powder can be sold. So the, uh, there's a lot of these things. Um, you know, traces of it going into your processed food, your juices. That's so disgusting. Well, it's occultism, you yeah. know, and they want everybody in on the practice. So they put it in your food unknowingly. And that's the, that's the part that I think um, is most upsetting is people don't even know what they're eating half the time or what's in it half the time or what companies that these foods are being processed through and which companies are involved in it. Is there a way for people to find that out? Is that information, has somebody put that out and somebody can go uh, watch a YouTube video or go look up articles? They can research all day long. I mean, at this point, it almost seems like they're all the big conglomerates are in on it, catalog, you know, all, all, all of them. Um, but I don't remember what I was saying. I keep doing that. It's okay. We we're just talking about the human remains and food. And if people can have access in any way to the best bet, instead of doing research, 
and, and trying to figure it out and just stop eating processed food. You know, get on the herbs, stop taking the farmies. Um, I, I have a really good herb shop that I go to and I get herbs for healing, you know, and, and natural healing techniques for these ailments. Anything, any ailment that you have, um, you know, can be healed. You're, you, everything that you need to heal your body is in the food that you eat. So you really just have to watch what you eat. Stop eating processed food, eat whole foods. Uh, take herbs and get off of the processed foods. And that's how you stop supporting these people. I haven't had cable or internet my entire adult life for the last 15 years. I mean, we had it growing up and stuff like that, but I've never had cable or internet. I mean, I don't support them, so I don't buy their movies. I don't support pedos, so I don't buy their music. I don't eat processed foods. I mean, I do every once in a while. I think everybody does. You can't really help it at this point. It's everywhere. But I mean, I, I try to stay away from a lot of that stuff. You know, I don't have cable or internet. So I don't, I don't buy into it. So stop buying into it. I think if everybody did that, a lot of these places wouldn't be able to continue the way that they are. And right. we're the ones that sign right. their paycheck by buying their products, buying their music, buying their food, going to their concerts, going to their shows, going, you know, we're the ones that sign their paychecks by doing that. So if everybody would stop doing that, um, stop buying their products, stop participating, <laughs> it, 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 a, a lot of it would diminish. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree more with you. And I think that that's the absolute best advice. I always say like, we pay for so much more than just with money, like watching it on the TV and going to a concert and buying an album, whatever it is, just participating in things that we know, Hey, this person probably doesn't stand for things that, that we stand for. Who cares if they have a good song? Like there's tons of independent artists and there's always, there's people working on the other side that you can go support that have just as good, if not better quality things than what most people have been exposed to in the mainstream. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and the mainstream is owned by all of their friends in the cult, you know, so they only push the narrative that they want you to see and know. Um, and that's just how it is. That's, I mean, don't support mainstream, turn the TV off, you know, stop paying for cable. How prevalent are cults as far as I know globally, we can say that, but I think another piece that is hard for others to grasp their mind around is that piece of how prevalent this child abuse is, how prevalent these cults are, and kind of where that landscape lies in the world. What do you mean? Like, how many cults are there? How how spread out is this? How big? Thousands thousands you know yeah. there's spinoffs of them too you know but they all say it's all one and the same that's how you know that's how i was taught and that's what i've heard growing up it's all one and the same yeah. um it's brotherhood you know it's brotherhood say you and me and a bunch of other survivors get together to do what we're doing and raise awareness about these things um can be classified as occultism you know i mean we could we could start our own cult <laughs> it's brotherhood you know, it's a coming together of people with the same common goals. The only problem with the cult I came from is it, it is satanic and, and they, they do not have any regard for human life and they really only care about themselves, their dick and their money. And I've told members that, you know, out of pure anger and animosity for what they've done to me and many others. But it, it is true. I mean, that it, they don't care about humans. I've watched a lot of human hum, humans die, you know, when men, women, and children, whether by hunt. Um, they're notorious for making murder look accidental. My father would run people off the road. He would strangle women to death, um, drug them. So it would look like an accidental overdose or it would look like a hanging instead of a strangulation. And it would look like they just ran off the road in a single car accident. I know a lot of people that have died in single car accidents that were run off the road by members of the cult. And sometimes I would be forced to be in the car. I didn't even know where, you know, I thought we were driving. 
somewhere and then all of a sudden you know shit was going down so what would be the reasoning for running were these targeted people that people like targeted people you know? that were trying to get help trying to get out you know that grew up friends of mine that grew up in the cult being drugged silenced And so they would just take them out instead of allowing them to go speak. They would maybe know their schedule or know where they were. And I'm, I'm assuming a lot of these people were probably tracked if they were in a cult with a chip or maybe their surveillance on their car or something on them. And Absolutely. so you'd have access to knowing where they were to be able to stage that. Absolutely. And these smartphones are just a way for them to continue tracking us and hunting us. Like I said about the hunting, they do hunt and this is just a way to hunt people more easily. Everybody around the world has these smartphones now. Everybody can be listened to through these devices. They can be seen through these devices. They can tap into any household in America that has these devices in them and listen to every conversation going on. Um, and that has been done to me. I put surveillance around my house and then I was being watched through my own damn cameras. So anything like that, I mean, you, you almost have to get back to basics, which is what I think America needs. And I've been saying that for a long time, everybody needs to get back to basics. I mean, we need to go back to the barter and trade days and just start, you know, having a sense of community because we don't have that anymore. And um, people need to start coming together and realizing what's actually going on. Um, I have tape over my cameras so that I can't be seen through them, but I know I can be heard. I try to put my settings off. A lot of people don't know how to adjust their settings, but it's important. You know, some people can't tap into your devices and listen to the conversations going on privately within your home. So that's a, a way that they track people now, these advanced, advanced technologies. They're tracking and tracing people that way, which makes it easier for them to hunt. What other hunting do they do aside from maybe surveillance or phone or chips? Uh, my dad would prey on women at the beach. He always had binoculars, these high powered binoculars under the seat of his car and he would go park somewhere, follow women, stalk them. Um, um, he would always introduce himself as like Russell or he would use an alias. His name was Robert. So he would tell people his name was Russell. And he was very charming. He was very good looking. Um, always one with the ladies and you know he would pick these women up and you know if they went home and told their mom or their friend hey I met this guy Russell last night or whatever and then my dad would take them out and then they would turn up dead and you know people would be looking for this Russell guy yeah she said she met this Russell guy the other night so they would be looking for Russell not Robert you know so they used aliases they were masters of disguise uh, they would shave their faces or grow their beards out when they were getting ready to hunt um, so that they, you know, could just disguise their looks or they would, they would actually use the, I mean, they were members of the CIA too. So they had masks, um, they had different skins, they call them skins that they could put, you know, over your, your lip, you know, to, to change the shape of your lip. They could put them on your eyelids on you know, whatever. They had these little skins to change the um, features of your face or your profile so you wouldn't be able to be identified. So they were using skins, they were using masks, they were using wigs, hair, uh, bald caps. I mean, really you could put a bald cap over your hair and it looks like you're bald. And things like that. So they were masters of disguise. That's pretty scary because you think about all the people that we walk by every day and we never consider, or the guy that comes up to us at a bar or the person at the park, wherever it is that you meet people, that's they never. They could absolutely be wearing a disguise. And with these facial recognition techniques now and all this technology, they're taking people's faces and, um, you know, through their, their facial recognition and they're making masks of those people. So I have actually gotten into the car with who I thought was my cousin because it looked exactly like him. They had done a facial recognition of him and made a mask of him that fits perfectly over your face, you know, wh whoever's face that they're, they're doing. So it's like face off type stuff. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie with John Travolta, who, who I've also been raped by, but um, they're basically taking other people's faces and put, you know, putting their faces on going out in public and acting as this person. 
like I said, I've gotten into cars with people who I thought was like a cousin or a friend coming to pick me up for dinner. And it wasn't it turned out to be, you know, somebody in disguise. That's it's scary point. and it can happen to anybody and it is happening to people. It's happening to me. And so going back with, to your dad, cause I want to talk about him for a little bit. So you call him a serial killer and you just talked about some of the victims that he would target. Was there a specific was it just certain women that he would target or what was his fetish with that that would compel him to choose these certain people? I'm not sure. I just think it was a sickness. Yeah. You know? It was just a sickness. And um, I think he felt like he was good at it. So I think when he would go hunt, he would just prey on on the ones that looked vulnerable they they were they knew body language they they could tell by watching someone um if they were alone or if they were sad or if they needed comfort they they knew before they approached them like how they were going to approach them but just by watching them um i don't know how how he targeted people i don't think that he did just sometimes it was just random other times there were targeted people that needed to be off yeah quote unquote, um for trying to speak out or you know that became a threat to the network um kind of a hitman in that way too of this they is were assassins they essentially were assassination hit crew and they used to call themselves the zoo crew and it was very true because they were very much like animals uh feeding off of your you know energy and your blood and your bones now as far as the programs that you were involved with you talked about nasa what other experiments are happening on a high level involving humans or children they're morphing um they're morphing themselves you know with the the viral uh reptilian implants they put the parasite in their eye um I, there's a video on my page about that but they're how morphing do, how do they do so, that? it's a parasite that they're basically injecting in their bodies they're more they're morphing themselves into something that we're not i mean we're human beings but i think they're really trying to transform themselves into higher beings uh they call them reptilians aliens there's um uh, what are they called the tall grays i think i've met a few uh which are like alien forms they're um human but not human they look human they can uh shape shift and they're taking these parasites dna all this stuff and mixing it together and creating their own beings there's a, a being that is on my page a video of a being that was found on the side of the road um they're just they're making these beings and labs, robotics, things like that. So transhumans essentially, or just mixed breed humans. So they're trying yeah. to animal, yeah, animal sites, different DNA, animals. Yeah. Now with the, the thing in the eye that you were talking about, there's a lot of photos that circulate online with, you know, why did Mitt Romney get punched today? You know, he walks in public with this big black eye and then you see it on all these very prolific people. Is that what you're, what you're talking about with inserting the, the parasite through the eye? Yes, they've all been essentially transformed. I think a lot of these people, once they get into this type of practice, their blood changes. You know, there's things in their blood that's not in our blood. So it makes their uh, brotherhood stronger, their bloodline stronger, and it's kind of kept within. So it's like they want everybody to get these shots. They, you know, they're criminalizing people that don't want to get these COVID shots and stuff, but their blood's different than ours. You know, it's been infected with a lot of different things than ours. And these things, do they bring them, obviously a lot of the stuff that they give regular society creates disease, it creates sickness, it creates all kinds of dysfunction in our body. Are the things that they're giving themselves in their belief system, or even maybe it is scientifically factual if they're doing experiments, are these things elevating them as humans? Is that actually true? Or is that more of a belief system that they have? I think it's just their belief system and it's kind yeah. of a science 
experimentation. It's just an experimentation. I mean, you're basically signing your life over to be experimented on and they say for these higher purposes, but it's really for what? You know, look what it's doing to societies and culture and humanity. You know, look what it's doing to our children. It's awful. And and like I said, they're forcing participation by putting it in your food and not even telling you. I mean, look what's going on with COVID. Exactly. And a lot of people have no idea what's going on with the virus or anything that we're talking about right now. You know, it's like the connections are really hard for people to comprehend. And that's well, such a, I mean, it is my belief and this might be far-fetched for some, but it is my belief knowing what I know and seeing what I have seen that COVID came from one of these blood variants from, from a cult member, you know, really possibly you- from possibly from human remains being juiced or used and spread like a virus. And so obviously the whole um, bat story, I think a lot of people don't buy into that, but what you're alleging is that it's actually a human experiment that they created this from and these different blood variations that they're- Using human meat, yes. That's what I think. That's what I believe and call me crazy, but that's what I think. So they're also, they're using, the experiments are also- in a sense, instead of just, we're going to find, we're going to use children. We're going to use other people to do these experiments, to find what can elevate us and make our blood better. They're also doing the opposite. How can we infect society more with being sicker? How can we, um, how can we create bioweapons, more bioweapons to release on the public? Yep. Yep. That's absolutely and, get them, and then get everybody to buy it and think that it's good for them. You know, these smartphones, when they first came out, everybody was on the you know top of the line to go get them. Oh, yeah. And they still are. are global you know, tracking for a new one. These are global tracking trackers. You know, you could be tracked on, on these devices anywhere by them. And we're so addicted to them. We always have them on us. Did you and have, you whenever you were growing up, were you... Did you see technology and did you see things that the general public didn't or yes, did you have advance notice of something like a cell phone coming out way before it yes. was going to you? Yes, I did. My brother had all the electronics. He had a, you know, when I was a little girl and they, you know, pagers were coming out and stuff like that. He had laptops, he had cell phones. They were using Twitter and YouTube back then, girl, before anybody even knew it was big. And all the elite kids were, you know, and these science kids and these programs around the world and this cult, you know, were using them. Absolutely. When I was a very small child, my brother was making me, you know, get on Twitter and read his Twitter with them and stuff like that. But they were using apps and things like that way a long time ago before they even got released to the public. They were experimenting with us children, getting the children addicted to them, get, seeing, you know, they, they were doing all that way before, like I said, way before they were released. So are these my, stories of, let's just say Mark Zuckerberg creating this in his college dorm, is all of that even how these companies came to be? Were these always government programs? And that's the story, the facade that they feed the public? I mean, it's possible. I haven't really done a whole lot of research on Zuckerberg, but it, I don't know where he came from, what his family ties were or what programs he could have been in as a child either. And e- even programs that he was in that he didn't really even know he was a part of, you know, because they, they don't tell you, you know, they just do things to you and then you go home and it's kind of like you're back to normal life or whatever. You don't, you don't identify those things, but I don't know where he came from. I don't know what his family life was like. I don't know who his family was or what ties they had to the network, but I'm sure they're there. (laughs) And there's probably a reason why he's who he is now. And you mentioned bloodlines are something that's of importance to them. Is that a big part of distinguishing who kind of makes it in the world? Are most of the people that we look at as high positions in, in authority or society or government, wherever, are most of those or all of those people bloodlines? Is that a big part too of how people elevate in society? Well, it is said that there's really only 13 bloodlines that you can stem from. So there's only 13 families basically that you came from. If you go back in, in your history, you can figure that which bloodline you came from and then go from there. Um, they say to follow your maternal lineage back to, to figure that out, what, you know, what, what family you actually came from. Um, 
but yeah, they do, do a lot of the ancestral relationships are very common in the cult. Fathers sleeping with daughters, brothers and sisters, cousins, you know, is, is all um, practiced in common. You know, we were groomed for that and having, you know, being raped by all the men in our family and group sex, you know, was not uncommon uh, to see a room full of naked people. It was not uncommon to be raped in a room full of people and other people were being raped also. Um, was not uncommon to walk in the house and see your grandpa having sex with the dog on the floor and choking the dog. They were into bestiality, real, real sick Satanist type violent porn, you know, it's like they would have sex with anything. They were having sex with animals. They were forcing participation from us. They would have sex with corpse and human remains. My dad became a necrophiliac. I think from being around it, he became attracted to it. Um, he became a necro. They call it necro. There was a band back in the day called necro. Um, he was a necro. He would have sex with human remains and corpse and then force participation from us to do the same child porn with corpse. It's disgusting. You know, so we've been infected with every disease known to man. I've had infections. I've been infected, you know, by, by means of rape or just, you know, in labs and stuff like that for experimentation purposes. But uh, we are immune. We are immune. Because Besides. of these things. It's strengthening the immune system, strengthening your bloodlines, strengthening family. And really they wanna keep, we're, I mean, most people that are, that exist in the world now are mixed bloodlines, whether that's double mixed or it's a whole bunch of different lineages that have just over time mixed together. It's important for them to keep that, that first bloodline that they believe is the most pure generation after generation after generation. Yep. It's wild belief system, you know, and they, they, they did allow us to study different religions. I would, I would scream Yeshua. Yeshua is the name of Jesus. And I never was taught about Jesus, but I would scream his name during violent rape and torture. So Jesus was with me um, through it all. And I believe that he is who saved me and the only reason why I'm still alive. Do you recall ever hearing that name before or did you just inherently that was spoken to you through him? It was spoken to me through Yeshua. I have met and heard the voice of Yeshua and he has guided me and directed me and delivered me from a lot of this evil. He saved me. He, he continues to save me and protect me. Is that, you mentioned that that helped you get through. What else did you, did you do to cope with all of that growing up? I was suicidal in my youth, um, 11, 12, 13 years old. I just wanted to die. I was being used so much. I was sore all the time. I had hip problems, back problems. I couldn't sit down. I couldn't wipe my butt without pain or blood. Um, you know, it was just awful. I wanted to die. I just felt like a piece of meat and I just felt like I was being used. And I was, I was, I was just a sold piece of meat being used. And that was it. You know, I had very minimal things as a child. Um, I didn't have a whole lot growing up. You know, we had bicycles and stuff like that, but we were used. They had us to use us for occult practice and for money. They would get money sent to them in PO boxes. They had PO boxes and safety deposit boxes around Florida. Uh, people had access to them. They would leave money and different things in there for my parents and my family. So they were being paid. You know, I remember going to the post office and, and seeing them collect cash out of the boxes. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing how this blends in so well to what we see every day to where it's hard to even consciously, it's like, once you know, you can't unknow, but if you have no idea, they've massaged themselves so smoothly into society and the way that they present themselves and even entertainment, how it's looked at as something to worship instead of something of what it actually is worshiping Satan. 
And like well, you said, doing initiation. That's exactly what you just said. It's entertainment. And for them, it was created for entertainment purposes. But mm-hmm. they were into some really sick shit. So they've got the upper world Disney stuff that you see in mainstream media that's pushed to get, it's basically to lure the kids there. Once you're there, then they can start programming you. Then they can start getting you into these other programs. And it's really kind of an innocent way that they get you into them. And you don't even realize that a lot of parents don't even realize it you know, taking your kids to these places and getting drawn into these things, but it is, it's for entertainment purposes. But unfortunately I was used for a lot of sadistic and violent porn underground, you know, by the same companies, Nickelodeon that you see on TV, you know, we're doing this to me underground as a child. And it's rampant in Florida. It's rampant all over the world, but I grew up in Florida and the network here and there are Freemasonry cop gangs are in on it, you know, that will pick you up or, or, you know, and take you to places. They're basically traffickers. They don't even have to rape you, but they just have to get you to where you're going, where you're told, where they're told to bring you and drop you off, you know? So they, there, there are traffickers that, that, that won't rape you, but they will pick you up and take you where, where they're told to take you. And they're traffickers. I mean, they're traffickers too. Now, how does Freemasonry fit into all this? People tend to separate that also and say, oh, well, it's just, you know, my grandpa was a Freemason, one of the lower level or this person. It's not bad. It's not. What do you have to say about Freemasonry, having seen it all the way from the very top levels? I grew up going to the lodges, um, the Blue Blue Lodge, mostly um, all over the place. I've been to lodges everywhere. It's a brotherhood. You know, um, I was trained as a Mason. There's only men allowed in. It's a brotherhood. So it's only men allowed. But I was a little girl being raised by these men in Freemasonry and in the lodges. So I had a lot of dads, essentially, and that were raising me and bringing me up this way. I was taught to fight. I was taught ballistics. I was taught how to shoot. Um, I am MK Ultra, And they are manufactured killers, you know, and they basically train you. So I was a gymnast. I was being used... Um, and performances. I was uh, being used on stage at some of these shows, Ozzy Osbourne and all these other concerts. When I was a kid, I would be taken to and raped. I would be raped on stage. I would be used, thrown into the audience for other people to use. Um, At 9, 10, 11 years old, I was dropped from a trapeze at an Ozzy Osbourne concert into the crowd. And my brother was telling me, when you get down there, just start telling people that you're only 12, you're only 12, just say you're only 12. He got in trouble for telling me to say that because once he dropped me down into the crowd, I started saying, I'm only 12, I'm only 12. But he made me lie. I wasn't 12. I was actually 10, but I was really tall, you know, skinny, lanky, long legs. And and I could, I could pass for being a little bit older back then. Oh my God. I can't imagine how horrific that must've been as a kid. And Everybody on stage, all the people that are organizing this, maybe not all of them that are organizing it, um, lighting and things like that, but the entertainers on stage are very aware that this is happening. Oh yeah, absolutely. They're part of the program. Absolutely. You see it happen on stage right in front of you all the time. People being initiated, blindfolded, put in these, you know, suits. I put pictures on my, on my page and their initiation processes, um, into the cult and into Freemasonry and, you know, different ranks and degrees. I've been through a lot of them. I have pads, what they call pads on the bottom of my feet from walking fire. It's kind of mind over matter practice they put you through and a desensitization process they put you through. But I do have pads on the bottom of my feet from walking fire, um, hot coals and things like that, that they would make us do. What was the purpose of having you do that? Is that just a practice? It, yeah. it's a it's just a practice that they do um at fires you know they have these bonfires they worship satan around a fire um we do chants and stuff like that we would do and a lot of times we would be masked and drugged they were giving us these potions but they were probably you know a, a adrenochrome and things like that they were giving us shots of so it was like okay girls time to take your shots you know so it was like we were you know we we would act like we were the adults and we were taking the shots so we would drink these little potions and then put our masks on and our white t-shirts on and then we would be used uh, for, for ritual abuse. Raped by all the men, literally formally trained 
uh, with sex with the younger men. So the, the younger boys would come through and practice on us. And then the older men would come through and practice on us when they were done raping us. It's a lot of harvesting energy too for them. They're, they're literally like vampires, you know? They are vampires. They feed on adrenalized blood on your energy that they can suck from you. And they've, they've got it down to a science. <laughs> now this adrenalized blood, that's another thing that people say, that's just a conspiracy theory. Nobody's doing that. No, I used to get sucked right on my neck. They had like a pick. It was like a pick. And after um, tormenting you, because they can get you, you know, they'll work, they'll get you worked up. They'll beat on you. They'll hit you. They'll kick you around. They'll get you so scared and so confused where you, you're just full of adrenaline. And then they'll, you know, stab you in your neck with this pick. And my brother, usually they would extract it and then drink it, but my brother would drink it right out of my neck. He was just like a pro at it and thought he was good at it. So he'd stick his pick in my neck and yeah, it's torture. But it happened to me my whole life. So it was like, I would, I mean, he would say, oh, you like it, you like, he would blame, like, he would blame it on me, like, oh, you like it, and I'm like, I don't have a choice in the matter here, you know, I was never been giving, given a choice, but to avoid a lot of the trauma, sometimes I would sit there and just kind of kink my neck over and just let him do it, like, okay, just do it, just leave me alone, you know? Why do you, why is blood so important? I know there's people that listen it, that are listening that have heard of adrenochrome. That's not something though that I have actually talked about on here um, really in depth from, from the experience of somebody. Why is that so important to them? What does that signify and what does it do to somebody if they drink it? Because it's like a drug. Um, from my experience, when I have seen people on it, they become really high really hyper their pupils dilate you can get really big you just it's just this really big rush they get all excited you know they're they have all this energy and then they're and then they're ready to hunt you know so i don't think adrenochrome i i mean i'm i'm sure they're taking it alone but i think they're also mixing it with other drugs mm. you know to get you know high reach higher levels of consciousness that's the only way to do that is through these these drugs and so there's the energy harvesting, like you said, where blood is, you know, especially from a child, you're infusing yourself in their eyes with this innocent, pure blood that is now in your body. Is there any truth to this being something that they believe is a fountain of youth also? Yes. Yes. They believe that it keeps them youthful and young. Yes. Is it addictive? highly. I think that's why it's so rampant because people really can't stop the practice and they don't want to. And when they try to, they're kind of sucked back into the cult, you know, and I've seen people try to leave and then get sucked back in and start practicing again and start doing these things. What is different with blood versus say a, another drug like heroin or meth or something? Why don't they just try to get high off of those things what is different with the high that they get from this adrenaline well, they do i think that when when adrenochrome is not available to them that's what they use they use the street drugs they use you know all, all those other drugs that are essentially plant-based those are all plant-based opiates from opium and opioids yeah and afghanistan is one of the um has you know like some of the biggest poppy fields in the world and op opium opiates and it's rampant in Afghanistan, places like that. So I, I think the invasion of Afghanistan had a little more to do with what we've been told. Oh, I'm sure there's definitely a lot of that story that- Well, after the invasion too of Afghanistan back in 2001, after the attacks, like that's when Big Pharma really started pumping out this whole, um, the opioids and the pill epidemic started. And obviously and of, they wanna take anything- that's making a lot of my, money and make yeah, themselves money. Exactly. Well, and exactly. And uh, Zachary Rose and Tim Rose, I was a child bride too, and forced to live with them when I was a child. 
um, they've, they've beat me to death before and left me in shallow graves and I was resuscitated. I was used by them a lot. Um, I've been a realtor for them. I've sold them houses. They are grave diggers. Uh, they run heavy equipment. They own a construction company. He runs one of the um, biggest construction companies in Indian River County. He builds roadways, parking lots, things like that. Um, and I've seen them bury human remains in and around Indian River County my whole life, you know, and they have a conglomerate together with Kevin Hawkins and they're flipping these properties. They'll buy a property and restore it and bury evidence and human remains in the yard and flip it to unsuspecting new buyers. Um, so it's a practice. They are doing it. It is an operation. It is going on. Um, but they got into the pill mill, the pill mills. He actually served eight, I think, out of a 16 year sentence for um, operating pill mills in the state of Florida and being part of the whole Oxy Express that was going on down there. They have, like I said, food machinery and chemicals, FMC, where my dad worked. They manufacture machines that and pill presses. So they were buying pill presses not just juicing equipment for the packing houses and the fruit business, but they were buying um, machines. They were pressing their own pills, buying all the ingredients to manufacture their own pharmaceuticals and selling them to people through these pill mills. Um, so there was a lot of people, they had a, a, a customer base coming from Ohio, Tennessee, Kentucky, where they couldn't get drugs up there. They were coming down to Florida where the laws were laxed on it. They were getting around, they had loopholes in the laws. They were getting around and they were operating these huge, uh, pill mills, making millions within a couple of years and people all over the world and all over the United States flying to Florida just to get drugs from them because they were easy to get and they were pushing them so hard. Oh my gosh. And this, this started after, like I said, after the invasion of Afghanistan and they took over the poppy fields. I've had um, friends that were in the military saying, who do you think is over there guarding the poppy fields? Like U.S. military, well, I've been over there you know, guarding the poppy fields. I had people in the military posting pictures while they were over there. So I think a lot of that came from, from over there. It's worldwide, like I said, it's it's worldwide and it, it is a huge problem, but my family is in the cult. Everybody that I know is in the cult. Everybody that I've ever known is in the cult. I wasn't allowed to know anybody outside of it. What jobs did you have? You mentioned a realtor. What things did, did you get um, um, that's it. placed into or yeah? That's it. I, I graduated high school. I got my real estate license and that's all I know. So for 16, 17 years now, I have been a licensed realtor in Indian River County and working for the Lafferty Group. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but the Lafferty Group Real Estate I've worked for for the last eight years is also Lafferty Group Private Investigations. So I have been used for investigative purposes in the last year or eight years um, to infiltrate. You know, the only way to infiltrate a network like this is from the inside. So I have been used for investigative purposes because I am on the inside and technically underground is a term we use. I don't, you know, I didn't grow up underground, although there is kids in the cult that do never see the light of day and are literally underground, but I am underground because people don't know who I am. Um, there are people that have known me in Indian River County for 20, 25 years that don't know who I am or what I've been used for, where I've been. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. Do people, are people aware that you've been trying to tell your story or do you kind of keep that part yeah. separate so, where you're telling people information, but the facade that you put out to the public is still very normal to people. Right. And that's what I was expected to do on my Facebook. I was only allowed to post, you know, about my work and my, my travels and, and this and that. And it, it was not to be talked about, obviously. Do they know that you're talking out at all now? I am seeing um, some brand new Twitter accounts being made and trying to follow me with zero followers and things like that. So I know, and I've got little bots piping up telling me, oh, that never happened to you. You're crazy, you know, whatever, things like that. So I think there are people that are becoming aware that I'm speaking about it now. And that's fine. I, I am a targeted individual, so let that be known. Just be aware. It's almost you're, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, you know, like. I have felt that way my entire life. I am damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. So here I am. <laughs> I'm so grateful that you're here. And I know we're, we kind of touched on that two hour mark that we'd maybe kind of wrap it up around there. Um, one thing though, I do want to ask before I get off, I can't not ask this because I know that I'll have people say, why didn't you ask her about Ron DeSantis? 
in Florida before we got off. And we can definitely, I, there's so much that we talked about today that I want to dive more particularly into. Um, but I wanted to ask you about him. People ask me about him and I'm like, I don't know. He looks great, on the outside, but I'm not in Florida. No, but he's somebody that, that society looks at as, you know, this really great, you know, he's known as America's governor or yeah. yeah. And everywhere. So I wanted to ask you about him too, um, from being in Florida and having some insight on that, what your thoughts are on, are on him. The only thing that I really know, cause like I said, I don't watch mainstream media. I don't have cable. I don't really keep it. I mean, it's hard for me to keep up with so many people. I have a few people that I'm zeroing on on myself personally, but DeSantis is not one of them, but I do know that he owns uh, Westgate uh, properties in and around Florida. And I know that my entire life, I have been taken to Westgate properties and ritually abused and raped by cult members and gang raped by, you know, on camping trips, these, these ranches are huge. They are wetlands. A lot of times they are ranch lands. They are used for camping, recreational use. They're not housing develops. It's not residential property. Um, so people go out there, um, Westgate River Ranch in particular, I've been taken to River Ranch my entire life. Um, they have a bar out there. It's basically a bunch of campgrounds. And, you know, I've, I've been used there. So I know that it's happening on his properties um, because I've been there. A lot of people have, you know, with their four wheelers and their side by sides and their campers and they're out there doing that. Um, also uh, state, state parks and um, national parks are being used a lot for occult practice. You know, we used to go quote unquote camping a lot when we were kids but I would be taken basically out into the woods where nobody would hear you scream because you're in these vast open areas and used for ritual purposes you know forced to chant around fires and and a lot of them would go out and be masked they would have gowns on or they would have hoods on or masks on so everybody everybody was doing their their thing in these in these satanic meetings and meeting places and a lot of them like I said were national parks state parks I have been taken to and used all over the world all over the United States and especially in Florida but that's all I really have on DeSantis is his Westgate properties I have been taken to and used on so I don't really know horrific you know like I know so many things happen that skirt under the radar. So like you said, there's people that aren't involved that would never know who is because everything looks perfect. They look like any normal person from the outside. So mm -hmm. I can totally get that there's so much hidden so well that there's not investigations going into it because people don't even know that there's something to investigate. But I also understand that you know, guilty by association sometimes too with, with connections. And you look at a lot of prolific people that we hold high in society. And it's like, first of all, how did you get there? And then second, you know, that, that's, a, that's a huge one. Yeah. How did you get there? And who did you know? And who did you blow? And that's kind of the, you know, running joke in the call is, okay, well, who did she know? Or who did she blow? <laughs> you know, who do, or him, it didn't matter exactly right and so that's just that's something too that i i hope people start asking a little bit more instead of just trusting that oh they got there on their intelligence their goodwill they're a good person it's like or did they get, or get to the root you know and i keep saying that to people get to the roots get to the roots get to the roots it's very important that you get to the roots of these people these issues, um, you know, dig, find out where they came from, find out their familial ties because everybody has them. A hundred percent. And if you, I mean, most people, most people are tied to the cult in some way. I mean, most people have been affected by occultism in their life and don't even know it, but yes, our <laughs> whole lives since we're born, we're thrown into and Disney, right? Everybody, like, nobody is safe from it. Not, not a single person is safe from it. There's no exceptions to that rule. Everybody is affected by occultism. That's really been like one of the hardest things for me is like realizing even as much as I know now, how little I actually know, because it's like, I'll have girlfriends that get this name brand purse. And then, then I'm like, oh, I forgot about that brand. I'm going to go research it. And it's like, oh my gosh, or Victoria's Secret or Disney or whatever it is. It's like, 
when you actually go look at these things, you realize how much corruption is behind all these things that they inflate in front of our faces and make us want and desire and crave it's and spend money to get. Yes. It's branding. Um, just like they do, you know, cattle, it's branding, you know, and I don't want some dude's name on my underwear. I don't want some girl's name. You know what I mean? So I wear plain white t-shirts. I don't wear logos. I don't wear any of that stuff. I don't support it. I don't, you know, I never wore the name brand clothes, the hill figure, the Tommy, the, this, the, that I never, I never did that. You know? So like I said, stop supporting them. You know, people can, and, and hopefully will, Stop supporting them. Stop buying their brands. Stop branding yourself with their material. Stop, you know what I mean? Stop eating their foods, their processed foods. Stop going to their movies. Stop buying their music. Stop buying their equipment and electronics. Exactly. And stop giving it your time, your attention. Stop giving it any part of you, your energy. I live very old school. I don't have cable, you know, so entertainment purposes are spent on bike rides and other healthier activities than, than that mind numbing stuff. Um, like I said, I try to watch my diet. I try to treat myself holistically and naturally at home um, without going to the doctors. I don't like taking pharmaceuticals. I don't like even taking aspirin or ibuprofen, you know. Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm completely with you on that, especially after learning about, you know, where a lot of this stuff comes from and like what the end goal is. Like it's never, some of it might help. Like there's probably a few times a year that I take say an ibuprofen, but even that I used to take and pop those all the time. If I needed anything for pain or just to take the edge off something, or if I worked out and I was sore, like so unconsciously, just, I'm just going to take four of these, you know? And it's like, I never even considered what that was doing to my body over time and like who that's benefiting. And I never even questioned, well, can I heal this myself? can I do something else besides just pop this, you know, and you can look up the statistics about the average American and how many pills they eat in their lifetime. That's crazy. Oh my gosh. I don't, I can't even fathom how many I've even taken in my life before understanding the power of my own healing and how I can take charge of that so much on my own, you know, and yeah, I don't well, people don't realize that pharmaceuticals and medicine is essentially plant-based, you know, they're, they, these are, they're deriving these things from plants and from you know the natural earth so you know if you you can treat yourself you know holistically and naturally at home with herbs and the same type of plants that they're putting in your pharmaceuticals with other chemicals exactly you, know, you can do the herbs without the chemicals <laughs> exactly. yes and i really hope like i hope society comes back to starting to look at some of that it and will. I think we're, I think yeah. we're moving forward in that direction, to be honest with you. And with everything that's going on and more awareness being raised about that type of stuff, I think that's the direction we're moving and that's the direction that we're heading. And I am, I'm happy about that, you know, and you do, you, you have to lead by example. So it's just other people will learn from you when you start taking, taking those steps yourself. Well, I, think I just hope heard. everybody takes a huge step forward in that direction just to get away from the mess that we're in, you know? A hundred percent. And I think it's so inspiring what you're doing and risking to share this information because I know, I, I don't know, but I can only imagine how much, how much you're risking by, by exposing a lot of this and talking about it, especially on public and social platforms. So Kaylee, I appreciate you coming on. I'd love to, I mean, there was a lot that you talked about today that I'd love to unpack more. I didn't want to spend the whole time talking about, um, I wanted to dig into you a little bit in your story versus focusing just on the white house or just on Epstein and just on some of these other, um, aspects of your story that you talked about. So I'd love to bring you on to dive a little bit deeper into some of those. Cause I know that a lot of people, including myself, probably have a lot of questions on some of that, that maybe we haven't heard or just don't fully understand. Um, so if you'd be open to that, I'd love to bring you back on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just make me a list of questions or whatever and, and we can go through them yeah because I know there's just there's so much to cover it's like how do you how do you even begin to especially because a lot of what what you're talking about you have to tell other stories in order to understand the one story so it's true it's there's true just, there's so much to unpack and go back and forth with so let's definitely like let's do this again um twitter I lack eyes that is your handle are you on social platforms anywhere else that people can connect with you no 
Okay. Not anymore. I was when I was a realtor in Florida, but I'm not a realtor in Florida anymore. I have shut those accounts down. And the only one I have now is Twitter. So you can find me on there if you have questions or, or whatever. And you guys, I really encourage you. She's dropping stuff like crazy. Like I go through her feed every day and I'm just, I'm mind blown by a lot of the stuff that, that she's talked about. And we talked about a little bit of it, but just in these last couple of weeks that she's been on there, you go on her page and you are going to learn so much that you have well, never not for the faint of heart either, you know, um, get on there with love and understanding and try to, to understand, you know, a lot of people I'm seeing angry, uh, comments and things like that, which is totally normal and, and, and understandable, but, um, uh, these things are being done. These things I have experienced and, and it is hard to share, but, um, I hope that people can understand, you know, you know, wh where I'm coming from. And you present it in a way that's very educational too, you know, and I appreciate that because it's, it's nice and it's amazing seeing survivors now coming out and using their voices. It can get very emotional though. Um, and I, I can't imagine from experiencing it and trying to talk about it, it has to be a whole different level of emotion, you know? So Kaylee, the way that she has been presenting information, it's, it's almost like reading a story. You know, she has these really incredibly articulate threads that, that walk you through situations and people and names and in a way that's palatable and in a way that I don't want to say as unemotional, um, but it's not so much focused on the emotions versus the information. So I think even people that are newer to this, they can go, they can go and flow through, and maybe get angry or sad. I feel that way whenever I read it. It's very it's triggering. You know, it's hard reading well, this. I mean, exactly, and for me, I'm desensitized to a lot of that stuff because I've been around it. So it's real easy for me to talk about. People are like, God, how can you say that with just ease? Like you can just talk about it like it's no big deal. And I'm like, well, I mean, honestly, I'm just desensitized. I guess. It's you know, in your life, you don't know anything different yeah. you do now, but that was for your entire <laughs> life, even still, like that's all you've ever known really as being normal, <laughs> you know? Yep. Well, I yeah. It's a weakness and I'm not now it. with the weakness. <laughs> um, I'm grateful for you. I'm so happy that I, I mean, this is my first time actually meeting you. Um, I know yeah. we're all the way across the country. I'm in Nevada, but it's, it's awesome to actually get to talk to you because I've been chatting with you so much on, on Twitter. So I appreciate yeah. you so much coming on here, Kaylee. And yeah. I'm sure everybody's on the edge of their seats. Like I can't wait for her to come on again. So I'm going to try to connect with I'll you again. Soon so we can maybe put your whole series out together and just do a bunch of filming, make sure your story's out there and get this information out there as much as possible. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you. And thank you to everybody listening. This show wouldn't exist without you guys. And I know I say this a lot on this podcast, but I was really nervous to start talking about this stuff on a podcast. And it's just been amazing the support that I've gotten and realizing how many people actually do care about learning about this. They just don't know where to go to learn. So thank you everybody who's using this platform as a, as a space to, to learn and to share and to elevate voices. I'm seeing so many people share these interviews on their channels and talk about them and connect on social media. So thank you to everybody who's listening. It means the absolute world to me. Please connect with Kaylee, please on Twitter, share this interview everywhere, take clips of it, post it on social media, share it with people that you know that, that will listen, share it with people that, that you don't think will. All those are little seeds that we're planting. This is all information that it's happening, whether or not we want to know about it. And we need to empower ourselves with understanding how this system actually works and listening to the people who have actually experienced it versus going and listening to the news or listening to the government tell us about it. Like we need to actually go to survivors and listen to them. They're the ones that have the experiences. Um, connect with our sister podcast, the Save Our Children podcast with Becky and Bridget. They're also um, one of our sponsors and then connect with us on, on Telegram too. It's a little bit less shadow banned and the algorithms are different. We're able to share this information a little bit more. Um, so connect with us on Telegram, that information's below. Connect with Hatch Truth, who is also a big supporter of ours. He's given you guys a discount code to his, um, his retail store. Um, I don't benefit from that at all. It's just a gift that he gave. And it's somebody that I met on Telegram that just really appreciated the show and this information. So they share it to their really big channels, which is awesome. Um, so please just support all the people supporting us, support the survivors. And thank you guys so much for supporting us. And Kaylee, thank you again so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you too. And, and we'll see you guys next week. Yep, we'll talk soon.